So last time we finished discussion about analysis of variance and today we should start uh, with uh, some short comments about uh, alternatives uh, to analysis of variance or t-tests uh, uh, about so-called non-parametric tests. So let's start uh, this discussion and then we will switch to new topic uh, which is discussion about contingency tables. So first of all uh, let's discuss about alternatives to t-tests or analysis of variance about so-called non-parametric tests. So if we go back, uh, I would try like to, uh, to repeat that if you compute t-tests, uh, doesn't matter whether it is two independent sample, per sample t-test or analysis of variance, there are some assumptions about the size of your data file, it means about number of respondents uh, you have in your data and about distribution of your variable. Usually you expect that you have at least certain respondents for individual groups and if not your data should be distributed normally. And if these assumptions are not met it is not allowed for statistical reasons to use these tests and we call them parametric as you should follow some assumptions your data should have some parameters. That's why it is called parametric. And if you have small data file, uh, not normally distributed data, or you do not use cardinal variable, and your variable is only ordinal, you have to switch to non-parametric alternatives. So here's the table for individual data <coughs> designs for alternatives to classical uh, parametric tests. So if you have ordinal variable or low number of respondents use man whitney test instead of two independent samples t-test. If you like uh, to use more than two groups don't use analysis of variance in case of ordinal data or small data and use Kruskal Wallis test. And uh, we will not discuss about it, but you should know there is also some special tests for two or more related samples, and these are called Wilcoxon and Friedman tests. But we will not go through this topic. If you like to know more, read uh, Phil's textbook about it and try uh, examples which are included in this textbook. But I would like to show you only very simple example for uh, this Kruskal Wallis test or Man Whitney test as alternatives to two independent sample t-test and analysis of variance. So this will be our example. Here you have only uh, node where we can find these procedures in a SPSS environment. So that's included in analyze, non-parametric tests, and there are three options. One sample, independent samples and paired. So if we would like to carry out alternative to analysis of variance, we would go into non-parametric tests, independent samples, and then we will choose correct test. So we will start uh, this uh, topic uh, in SPSS environment. So please run SPSS and open our data file. So once again, ISSP 99 is a short SAV data file. And uh, if I remember well, last time uh, we computed analysis of variance uh, for uh, finding differences uh, uh, of average income uh, for individual groups defined by educational level. So our variables 
in which we were interested were uh, personal income B41A and educational level B8 and if I do remember well, uh, we uh, changed original coding uh, and we didn't use uh, eight categories, uh, but uh, we used only four categories or three, only four? Four. Okay, so, and now I would like to show you how to use the same data set for computation of non-parametric test and we will compare results. Of course, that our data file is quite big one. So we can use analysis of variance without any problem, but this is only example how to apply non-parametric test to the same data file and to the same variables. So uh, that's only example, not real usage. So first of all, we would change coding of B8 variable uh, and it will be useful also for future analysis. So uh, we will do some recoding and we will uh, collapse categories one and two, three and four, five, six, seven, and eight will be in the category. So this will be one, two, three, and four. This is uh, elementary or basic education. Uh, this is secondary without diploma. This is secondary with a diploma the third category, and the last one is tertiary education. So, only very quick recording uh, at the beginning. So, let's go into transform and recoding into different variable. I think it's well-known procedure for all of you. So the third variable in our data set is highest education, B8. Let's move it to the right window. Uh, new name can be uh, EDU only, as shortage for education. And click on change. So there is an assignment from B8, original education with eight categories. We will do new variable education and old and new values dialog can help you to define individual assignments. So. The first assignment codes one and two, and new code will be one. So that's the first assignment. The second one codes four and three, or three or four, and new value will be equal to two. The third one, fifth, five to seven, and new code will be three. And the last assignment from original value, eight. We will create new code, which will be four for tertiary educated people. So these four assignments, one and two is equal to one, three and four equal to two, five and seven uh, uh, equal to three, and eight is equal to four. So that's only short repetition of previously applied procedure. Continue and OK. So, and we can check that there is a new variable, the last one column in our data set, and only codes one, two, three, four should be present, and maybe there are some system missing values, as there were some people without any answer about their education level. Only uh, for better interpretation for our data, I would propose to add some labels for these categories. So we will go into variable view and here we will define values for the last one variable. So here click on values and Define values. Are there any problems? Still, are you with me? Okay, so the first value, let's call it elementary, for example. Second code will be secondary without a diploma, so I would try it only secondary without. The third one, 
secondary VS a diploma, and the last one, the first category, will be called tertiary education. So, I hope that all of you also prepare this variable as we will need it also for next procedure. So, uh, that's necessary for this lecture. So, that's it. So, new variable and coding and uh, assignment of value labels. And the next procedure, if you would like to compute something about means uh, or medians for our income, it's necessary to exclude people without any income or people without any answer about their income. So once again, let's define missing values for income variable, the fifth one in our data file. So let's go into missing and here define three missing values. Zero, six times eight, and six times nine. That's it. So for correct computation, it's necessary once again to define missing values. Only for your information, if you define missing values and save your data, this definition will be in newly opened data once again. So you can save definition of uh, missing values as well. Okay, so that's it. And now let's only briefly repeat uh, results from previous lecture. So last lecture, we applied analysis of variance to our uh, problem, which was, I would like to know whether average income for people with different education level is the same or not in the Czech population, blah, blah, blah. So no hypothesis for analysis of variance says, okay, there is no difference in averages in individual groups. Alternative hypothesis says there is at least difference between two from these four categories. And what was our result from substantive point of view? There was some difference and then we did multiple comparisons and we have found that for all pairs we can find, we can find statistically significant results. So all pairs were different according to their average income. And now we will switch slightly our problem. So we will not discuss about analysis of variance and we will use instead of it non-parametric alternative to this test. And non-parametric tests, not all, but mostly are not based on original data but they change original data into rankings. And they are not computing averages and differences for these averages, but instead of average, they use similar concept for data who are ordinal. And what is similar concept to average for ordinal data? It was the first lecture, I guess, of descriptive statistics. So for cardinal, we use means. And for ordinal, we use medians. So, no hypothesis. For this test, which is called Cruz Calvolis, so I use only shortage K and W, no hypothesis says medians, not means, medians are all the same. It means are all the same for individual groups for the whole population. And what is logical alternative? At least for two groups, there is some difference for medians. So at least two groups are different. And by expression different, I mean they are different in their medians, once again. So these hypotheses are about medians. So once again, you can apply non-parametric tests in case you have small data, which are cardinal, but not normally distributed, and you can use it also for ordinal data as well. 
So it's not necessary to have cardinal variable. So for example, instead of uh, income, we should apply it for variables such as life happiness, which would be from one totally happy uh, up to five totally unhappy, etc., etc. Okay, so let's show how to compute it by a SPSS environment. So let's go into analyze, it's not a big surprise. And there is special part of this menu which is called very simply non-parametric tests. And there are four options here. One sample, independent samples and related samples. This is the same as uh, it was uh, described in the presentation. These are new dialogues I would call it. And there is also some part of the history in the SPSS environment and you can go also into legacy dialogues and you can see that originally there were more individual procedures which are now in these three parts uh, covered. Uh, so if you like to know more about individual tests you can use these legacy dialogues but if you know what is your problem and what tests should be applied you can use these new dialogues maybe they are uh, more user friendly than previous uh, uh, legacy dialogues. So if you are comparing medians of income for individual education levels we know from previous lecture that we are about independent samples situation. So we will use the second procedure which is defined here as individual education levels people from uh, these groups are independent samples. They are not related. <coughs> okay and let's click uh, on OK and you can see that this dialogue is slightly strange in comparison with previous dialogues. This is quite new dialogue. I guess uh, maybe version 19 was the first one uh, in which uh, this dialogue was present. You can see that there is some question. So here by questions and answers SPSS will recognize what would you like to do. So the first question is what's your objective? It means what would you like to do to compute and there are three possible answers. Compare distributions across groups. That's not our goal. We would like to compare medians across groups and you can see there is some special option, the third one, customized analysis. So for this task, as you would like to compare medians, please choose the second option, compare medians. Okay. What is the next step? You have to go up and select fields and settings and set up all parts of the analysis. So let's go into fields and this dialogue is quite well known for us. You have to select variables for testing and for groups to be able to analyze your data. So it's quite easy to guess that we will use income as the tested variable. So take income, the fifth variable in our data set and move it to the test fields. As this is the variable in which we are interested in. We are interested in medians for income. And we are interested in medians for income for individual groups which are defined by education level. So the second variable which defines groups is our new variable about education. So we will take the last one variable about education and move it into groups. Are there any problems? Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of us are unable to put income in the test field. It says it, you can't put a ordinal field in there. Okay, I will check it. I don't know why, but in version 21 there is some bug I would say some problem so uh, if you would like to compute it correctly in 21 I don't know why uh, let's go once again into variable view and please change definition for B41A into measurement which is uh, scale so let's change ordinal into scale and then it works 
excuse me, I don't know why there is some problem uh, in this first version of SPSS 21, but uh, let's solve it as it is. So if you change uh, definition for this variable into scale, and let's go back into non-parametric tests, independent samples, comparison of medians, so I hope that uh, it can be uh, change that you can take in cam and move it to the right part of the window. So let's try it. Correct. Okay. So excuse me for this inconvenience. I hope it will be better uh, at your home computer. Okay. So the next what should be defined is groups by education level. So let's move it. And uh, what picture do you have here, only for my information? Do you have some picture? Only scale. Hmm. So there is some problem as correct information for non-parametric test is ordinal as well as scale. So, okay. So here it is. And the last, what is necessary uh, to add is some information about which test we would like to use. So let's go into settings. And by default, SPSS offer, I would like to say, one of the silliest tests, which is called median test. So please don't use uh, this test as default. So we will not choose median test. And if you like to compare medians for individual groups, the best test is Kruskal Wallace. So if you find Kruskal Wallace, it's on the right side in the upper part of this dialog. So please check Kruskal Wallace. And you can see that by default, SPSS will offer you multiple comparisons as well. It means not only testing whether medians are all the same or at least there is some difference for two groups, but SPSS will also compute for you then comparisons for individual pairs, the first one and the second one, the second one, and the third one, etc., etc. The same as we did by multiple comparisons last time analysis of variance. But here you can see it is by default. And you can change it also. You can say, I don't like any multiple comparisons, so click on none, or step by step down, but uh, it's slightly complicated, so we will not go into it. So all pairwise is quite nice default. Okay. So, we have defined the test, we have defined variables, we have defined our objective, and uh, you can try at home that if you change the objective, also the list of tests which will be available for you will be changed. And now, you can see it's slightly different, there is no OK here, but there is run or this uh, green arrow. So, if you click on run, we should find very quickly results. And you can see that results are very, very brief for uh, these new procedures. Or at least it seems a little brief as there is something about null hypothesis, there is something about our test, then there is significance, and there is also advice what you should follow. So you don't even, <coughs> you don't need uh, to know about hypothesis testing at all. As they say, oh, okay, reject new hypothesis. That's your conclusion. But please believe me, it's better to know something about hypothesis. And if you like to know more about testing and results, you can double click on these results in this model viewer. Uh, it's not working. Yeah. And uh, you can see some more results. So here you have some picture. Here you have some computation behind. And uh, if you like uh, to see results for multiple comparisons, so we have to go to the right side and change independent samples test view into pairwise comparisons. So right 
In lower part of this dialog, you can switch from independent samples to pairwise comparisons. So this is quite new fashion style of SPSS, these dialogues. And you can see very, very simple comparisons for your data. So if you compare this output with the output of analysis of Orion's from previous lecture, maybe this is better for you. This is nicer output. And if you remember last time, we have seen 12 comparisons. So there was elementary and second without, and also second without and elementary. The same, but there were two rows. Here we have only six rows for six pairs we have in our data. And you can see that there is computation. This is the same as for previous discussion for individual comparison. And the last column, let's say it's yellow, maybe orange. I don't know uh, which color uh, it is precisely. But this last column is the test about difference. And once again, not about means, but about medians between these two groups, these two groups, etc., etc., etc. And once again, the conclusion is the same as previously. So for all these pairs, we have found statistically significant differences. So this is alternative to analysis of variance by non-parametric testing, a new dialogue. So maybe you will like only these dialogues and you will forget everything about all dialogues at all. So that's it. Okay, is it clear? I guess you can apply it. Okay, so my first task for your homework is very easy and straightforward to guess. So I expect you will try to compute some task for this cruz calvulus test. So try to find one cardinal or ordinal variable and one variable which divides your data in at least three groups and try to find differences for medians. Okay, that's it. And now we will switch to new topic uh, which is called contingency tables. So first of all, what does it mean the expression contingency tables? So, First of all, uh, I use sometimes in my presentation shortage uh, CT only, so if you will see uh, CT, uh, that's contingency table. So contingency table is useful mainly for nominal and ordinal variables. And the main goal why we use contingency tables is flowing. You would like to combine two sometimes three, four, blah, 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 or more variables at once into one table and try to find whether these variables are related or not. So the main goal is to combine two or more variables, once again they are nominal or ordinal, and to find whether they are related or not. If we start with very easy stuff. So uh, first, I would like to show you something about descriptive statistics in contingency tables. So let's start with very, very simple contingency table and we will try to follow very simple task as well. In a few minutes in SPSS environment. So let's have male and female. It means gender variable and the second uh, variable for individual columns will be educational levels. So we know from previous discussion elementary, secondary without, secondary with a diploma and tertiary. So we have four categories of education which uh, creates uh, individual columns and rows are created by gender categories. And the easiest and usually by default in individual statistical software's output for contingency tables 
will be so-called observed counts. So what does it mean observed counts? So let's imagine our table can be like this one. 100, 200, 200, and for example, uh, 100. Uh, and for female, let's imagine it will be uh, 150, uh, 150, maybe uh, 250 and 50. And usually for contingency tables, we also try to compute sum for individual rows and individual columns. So if I sum up all these rows and columns, our values will be following. Three and three hundreds, uh, six hundreds, uh, three and three, uh, once again, six hundreds. In total, it's uh, one thousand and two hundreds. And for individual educational categories, it's two hundreds and fifty, three hundreds and fifty, uh, four hundreds and fifty, and one hundred and fifty respondents. And now let's go into detail and what can be found in contingency table. So first of all, I will start with these sums or sometimes we call this information uh, as marginal. This is margin for the table. This is the edge. So here is the frequency table for educational level. So this is the same information as we can find in frequency table. As there is information, we have 250 people with elementary education, 350 secondary without a diploma, etc., etc. Here, the second margin, the total for individual rows is distribution of gender. We have six hundreds of male and six hundreds of female. That's information we can say outside of the table. We can compute it by frequency table. But we are mainly interested in these cells. It means inside of this table. And let's try to interpret, for example, the first value of 100, which is in the first row and the first column, so it means cross for male and elementary education. So what would be interpretation of this value? Hmm? Let's try. What does it mean, this 100? It means that in our sample, we have 100 of people who are men, and their education is elementary, yeah? So this is combination of male, female, and educational level here. And we can interpret in the same way the second one, third one, up to eighth one, observed count here. So that's very easy. But the problem is that if you have table like this one, in these observed counts, these are real counts of people in our data file, it's quite a big problem to guess whether there is some relationship between row variable and column variable, as we call usually generally these variables as row variable and column variable. So it means it's quite a big problem to say whether there is some relationship between education and gender. Or in another way, we can say that we would like to know whether male and female have on average different structure for education. So that's the question about relationship between these two variables. So how to change the appearance of this table into some format that can help us to answer the question whether the structure is same or not the same. So I would propose to use some percentages, some relative computation 
instead of these absolute values. And if you would like to compare the structure of education for male and female, I would propose to compute something what we call row percentages. That's very easy to guess if I call it row percentages that the base for these percentages will be total for individual rows. Fortunately, it is the same figure here, so it's quite easy to compute it. And we will compute how many percentages are 100 from 600. 200 from 600, 200, 600, and 100, 600. So let's compute it. Uh, I think uh, it's not necessary to use any tool, only our head. So 100, uh, 100 divided by 600 in percentages, it's 1 6. So it's approximately 17, I guess. If we have 200, it's approximately 33, yeah? One third. Okay, the same figure here, and the last one, once again, 70. What should be the total for row percentages for individual row? If the base is here in the total, so here we should have 100, yeah? Okay, so that's row percentages for male for educational levels. Okay, for female, so 150 divided by 600, it's one quarter, so 25, 25, 25, and the last one, 50 divided by 600, excuse, excuse me, this mistake, it's not 25, uh, it's 25 plus uh, 17, so it's 32. And here is eight. eight. Yeah. Once again, the total should be 100. Yeah. And now maybe it's quite easy and straightforward to answer whether educational level for male, female, women, and men are different or not, at least in our data file. Can you see any differences or not in the structure of educational levels? Here you have 17, 25, 33, 25, 33, 32, and 17, and 8. So at least here there is some difference. There is also some difference here. These figures seem nearly the same. And once again, there is some difference in this category. But be Careful, we can see some differences in our data. This is only our sample once again. And if we would like to know whether there are some differences although in the, uh, also in the whole population, so we have to apply some statistical tools, some tests, or some alternative procedures. So here it is, so contingency table, observed counts, row percentages. In the same style, but I will not repeat it, I think it's obvious how to do it, we can compute column percentages, so the base would be total for individual columns. And in the same style, we can also compute uh, so-called uh, total percentages and base would be total number of respondents. So it will be based on one 1,200 people, and it would be not male with elementary education, but men with elementary education from the whole sample is blah, blah, blah percentages. So let's go and practice uh, this computation in SPSS environment. So I will only close the model viewer from previous procedure, and uh, we will try to do the same table. So it means table, for male and female and uh, educational levels. So uh, let's start uh, very easily uh, like this. So contingency tables can be found in analyze, 
descriptive statistics, and the fourth procedure, which is called cross-tabs. Sometimes, uh, but it's not very often in statistics, uh, contingency tables are called cross-tabulations, as they use at least two variables at once, so they make crosses uh, from rows and columns, that's why it is called cross-tabs. Okay, so here's the dialogue, and it's not a big surprise that there is one window which is called rows, the second one which is called columns. If you like to combine more than two variables, but we will not learn about it, you can use also the third window which is called layers. So usually the third, fourth, fifth, seventh, blah, blah, blah variable is called layers in contingency table. So here it is. And now the question is, what should be in rows and what should be in columns for a contingency table? We would like to use gender for rows and education level for columns. So it's easy to take the first variable into rows and the last one, as we previously prepared this variable about education level, into columns. OK, that's it. Click on OK. And let's see results. So we can see contingency table for our data. And here we can see observed counts. So for example, in our data file, we can find 72 men with elementary education. For women, uh, uh, the number is uh, 233, etc., etc. And now the question is, is there any relationship between these two variables or not in our data? And your answer should be, it's quite hard to recognize it here. Let's try to compute some percentages instead of it. OK, so let's ask SPSS to replace these observed counts by percentages. And for our purpose, row percentages would be the best. OK, let's change it. So here is only a small hint for you that if you like to change observed counts into percentages, you have to go into cells. So once again, analyze descriptive statistics and cross tabs and the third option which is called cells. So it means what will be included in individual cells, this is combination of individual row and column in our contingency table. So click on cells and let's see that by default observed counts are displayed. We don't like observed counts, so let's change it. And we would like to see some percentages instead of it. And here it is, three times of percentages, row, column, and total. And once again, for our purpose, for our question about relationship between gender and education level, row percentages are maybe the best. So let's choose row percentages. If you like to know more about your problem, to see more results, you can ask for row, column, and total at once. But only your table will not be very nice and it will not be easy to interpret your results. So I will propose to use only row percentages for this case. OK, that's it. Continue and OK. And here it is. So instead of observed counts or absolute figures, we have relative figures. You can see that uh, some for individual rows is 100. These are row percentages. You can see it here, percentage within gender. So here and here, computed percentages separately. And now we can ask one again the question, can you see any difference or not? And what's your answer? Can you see any difference here or not? Yeah. It seems quite huge difference here, here, maybe very small here, and also quite small here. But at least for two, first two categories, we can see some and 
it seems substantive differences. Okay. So that's the first insight. And now, as we discussed previously, we are now describing only our data. So this is only descriptive statistics. This is only description of my data, of my sample. But I would like to know whether I can also expect these huge differences, or at least some differences, for the whole population. So I would like to generalize my results from the sample to the population. And once again, if you would like to generalize, we have two tools in classical statistics. Tests or confidence intervals. For contingency tables, we use mostly tests. And the basic test is chi-squared test of independence. Chi is once again letter from uh, Greek alphabet. If you like to type it, uh, it's uh, very close to x. And uh, chi-square, uh, you can write like this one. And uh, chi-square is once again theoretical distribution. So we previously we discussed about normal distribution, t distribution, f distribution. So chi-square is another theoretical distribution. Uh, chi-square distribution can be theoretically uh, prepared if you take normally distributed variable and square them and sum individual normally distributed squared variables. So then the result will have chi-square distribution. But it's not necessary for you to know there are some special tables for chi-square distribution, but SPSS will do this step uh, for us, so that's not necessary to go into detail. But what we should know is what are hypotheses for this test and how to evaluate the test for our data. So, no hypothesis, and it's shift from previous discussion as we discussed about differences in means, medians, blah, blah, blah. So now hypotheses are about relationship or independence. And usually, no hypothesis says there is no relationship. Variables are independent. So if it is chi-square test of independence, which is the full name, so no hypothesis says, okay, you can see some differences in your sample, but there is no difference in the whole population. Variables are independent in another way. And alternative, that's quite easy to guess, variables are dependent. So let's go into computation and the evaluation for this test. So if you like to apply chi-square test into your contingency table, so once again, go into descriptive statistics and cross tabs. And here we have to visit new dialog, the second one, which is called statistics. So let's go into statistics. And the chi-square is the first one on the left side, in the upper part. So ask for chi-square. So, click on chi-square and let's see results. And it's slightly, slightly difficult. As you can see, there is not one chi-square test, but there is a table which is called chi-square tests in plural. So there is more than one test. But the classic test which statisticians used uh, uh, very often is the first one, Pearson chi-square. So this is the basic test for dependency or relationship in contingency table. Here is some value, uh, degrees of freedom, which is necessary to know for the evaluation if we wouldn't use computer. But for us, the most important is computation of significance, or here it is only asymptotic, uh, as uh, it is not precise value. And if you can see, the significance uh, is quite low, so it means probability of first type error is lower than 0 0.0005. So what would be the conclusion if we go back into our hypothesis? We expect relationship or not between variables in the whole population. Please help me. 
as I would like to know if you understand uh, uh, practice of testing. Hmm? Once again, significance is quite low one. We usually use for our decision 0.05 border. This is far below 0.05, so we... Huh? Once again? They are, they are dependent. Why is it so? As we said, okay, if probability of first type error is low, we risk and reject null hypothesis and we accept alternative one. So that's correct that we will say, okay, it seems that variables are dependent. Or in another way, in our case, the conclusion would be that educational structure for men and women is not the same. This is only another sentence, how to express this relationship or dependency for these variables. Okay, so that's it. Here I only need uh, to add uh, some uh, small notes, only technically. Computation for this uh, chi-square test, but it's not necessary to go into detail, and of course you do not uh, uh, need to know about it for the test uh, is uh, based for comparison of observed counts, it means these absolute figures, and something what is called expected counts. And what is expected count? Only for you to have some knowledge behind the test. So if you would take your contingency table and you would take your information at these margins, it means uh, these totals for individual columns and individual rows, you would compute expected counts very simply like this procedure. You would take the first sum in the first column and multiply by the sum for the first row and divide it by total number of respondents and you would have expected count for this first cell. For the second one, the same approach. This sum multiplied by this sum divided by total number of respondents. And you would compute expected counts and expected means that these counts would be present in your table if no hypothesis would be true. It means if these two variables would be totally independent. So the logic of the test is very easy to guess. You take your real data structure and you compare it to ideal data structure if your variables would be totally independent. And the more dependent your data are, the higher the difference between observed counts and expected counts. And this difference is easily evaluated by chi-square value. So the higher chi-square, the more related variables are. Okay, so that's only a technical hint how to compute it, but I will not force you to compute it by hand. And the second uh, note is also very necessary. If you like to apply this test, some assumptions should be met. And these assumptions can be evaluated from this note. Here is the requirement. So for correct computation, at least 80 percentages of expected counts should be above five. We can go back and SPSS says, okay, no expected counts are less than five. So all expected counts are above five. So no problem. So this assumption is met. And the second assumption is that no expected count should be zero. But if we can see that all expected counts are above five, so no zeros are present. So we can use this test to be sure that our result is correct. Okay. Next procedure we should apply in contingency table is uh, to compute uh, so-called contingency coefficient. So we know currently 
there is some relationship between two variables. But this relationship can be strong, can be moderate, or maybe can be quite weak one. And the size of relationship can be measured by contingency coefficient. Once again, we can go back to previous discussion about so-called Cohen's D, uh, eta squared analysis of variance, and we discuss about uh, these measurements that they are called effect sizes. Effect size means that you try to evaluate substantive meaning of your results, whether your results are substantively significant or not. Once again, if you do statistical test, you only recognize whether your result can be generalized to the whole population or not. But if you like to know whether your result is important, it means scientifically important, substantively important, you need some measurement of this importance. And these measurements are called effect sizes. And here we apply contingency coefficients. Mostly they are computed from chi-square value. And for better comparison, they are usually standardized. It means their values are in the range between zero and one. And usually zero is used for no relationship and one for perfect relationship. For example, if our relationship between male and female would be that all male, for example, would follow tertiary education and all female would follow elementary education, contingency coefficient for these data would be one. As we can perfectly forecast from the fact that you are male or female, what is your education? But in real data, usually values of contingency coefficient wouldn't be real zero or real one, but will be somewhere in this range. So, uh, last one command is uh, that mostly statisticians recommend to use Kramer's V, as there are more contingency coefficients uh, and Kramer's V is the most common. So, Let's try to apply uh, computation of contingency coefficient and let's see what is the relationship between gender and education. What's your expectation? What will be the value? As you study social sciences, you should have social imagination in your blood. So, what's your guess about possible value? Hmm? It will be strong, weak, moderate relationship, zero point. 1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.8. Hmm? Some guesses. Let's try. Probably over 0 0.5. 0 0.5, okay. Some other guesses to have some competing ideas. I wouldn't be so optimistic or pessimistic. It's up to you to decide what is optimistic or pessimistic. Of course, that uh, fair value would be zero. It means that Educational level is not influenced by gender at all. Of course, somebody can say fair value would be one, that only some part of the population should follow higher education, etc., etc. So let's try to compute it. So once again, descriptive statistics, cross steps, and uh, once again, let's go into statistics. And here you can see that the second option here for the nominal variables is called phi, that's another coefficient, and Kramer's v. So we will see two possible contingency coefficients, uh, phi and Kramer's v. Kramer's v is mostly used, so let's click on OK, and let's check the value. And here it is. Phi or Kramer's v, in this case, uh, same values uh, can be found, and the value is 0 0.22. So it's not big one, I would say it's quite weak relationship. And maybe I would say, fortunately, it's quite weak relationship. As the higher the value, the bigger the unfairness of educational level between genders would be. So this is quite nice value, I would say. And of course, now the question is, how to interpret this value? And my recommendation would be following. It would be nice to compute similar contingency table, for example, for another country such as Germany, Slovakia, US population, etc., etc., and then compare this Kramer's V and let's see whether, for example, in the US, this uh, relationship would be stronger or weaker. 
and then we would have some benchmark for comparison. This individual value will not tell us quite a big story. Only comparison can help us. So don't believe, excuse me, if you are American to American textbooks, which says usually 0 to 0 0.1, that's nothing. 0 0.1 till 0 0.2, very, very weak. 0 0.2 up to 0 0.3, uh, slightly weak, etc., etc. There are some general recommendations, but these general recommendations doesn't fit to all situations in real data analysis. So I would propose don't use these simple recommendations and compare your results uh, with results from different countries, different data file, etc., etc. Okay, and as uh, we are nearly at the end of the lecture and uh, we will not have uh, more time for the last uh, discussion for detailed analysis in contingency tables, so we will do it next time. So uh, please only uh, try uh, to analyze uh, your own relationship between two nominal or ordinal variables by contingency tables and interpret results. Uh, and next time we will discuss very briefly also about detailed analysis and contingency table and we will finish uh, the last topic uh, which is uh, discussion about correlation coefficients for uh, relationship between cardinal and ordinal data.